And then Tony, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, glad to have you all back. I was telling Rachel and Donna before we got started that uh, it's so gloomy and rainy here, and I just couldn't get in the mood to teach today, so I decided I would transport myself to somewhere bright and sunny by the magic of the internet and Zoom, and so I transported myself to the Garden of Gethsemane. Since we're talking about the life of Jesus, I thought that was appropriate. So, Last week, we talked about, we began talking about the historical Jesus and what we know about him from, from history. Remember, my, my lane of focus is history. I'm trying to stay away from the theological points of view because I'm, I'm not really uh, prepared for that. I'm not a minister. I'm not a pastor. I'm just a, a firm believer in the word of God. But I think it's important that we look at the historical background of the Bible and Jesus, and that was the whole thrust of my uh, presentations for the last almost a year now. So today we're going to continue looking at some of the non-biblical sources about Jesus. We know about the Bible. The Bible is a great book, and it's probably one of the, the best history books in the world. Not probably, it is. But at the same time, there are other sources of information out there about Jesus from non-biblical sources. Sometimes these sources were not friendly to Jesus, as you'll see here in a few minutes. Uh, and then we're going to switch gears and we're going to look at some of the archaeological evidence out there that supports the life of Jesus. So let's begin here. Uh, we talked last week about, we finished up talking about some historians. We specifically talked about Josephus, the Jewish historian who is very well known uh, to most of us, even as Christians that, that study the Bible. This is a Roman historian, a man by the name of Tacitus, and he wrote it in the first century, and uh, he was the one that kind of reported on Nero's decision to blame the Christians for the fire that destroyed Rome, and so this is what he wrote about the Christians and specifically mentions Jesus. He says, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. Christus, that was what he called it, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty under the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, a most mischievous superstition Thus checked for the moment, again, broke out not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome. So as you can see, this is not a man that's friendly to the Christian faith, but he is, he is giving us information about Jesus uh, that goes along specifically with the Bible. So that's very important. And this was right, this was written during the first century, and probably, um, I would say, maybe 50 years from the crucifixion of Christ. So it's a very important uh, piece of history there. Uh, there were also political officials. Uh, we talked about Pliny the Younger back when we were talking about Trajan, the Emperor Trajan, and uh, how he wrote to Trajan asking him for information about how he should handle Christians. Uh, what were the grounds for executing them? Well, let's look at a little bit more of his letter because he not only asked for information about how to, how to execute him, he kind of gave us some insight into what their practices and their thoughts were. And again, this is dated from about 112, so within 100 years of Jesus' Jesus's ministry and execution. In his letter, he relates some information he has learned about Christians, so he's informing Trajan what he knows about them. He says they affirm the whole of their guilt or their error was that they met on a stated day before it was light and addressed a form of uh, foreign prayer to Christ as to a divinity, binding themselves together a common oath, not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor to die a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then eat in common a harmless meal so while asking the emperor what were the grounds for executing these christians that he was having to deal with he also was telling him what i know about them and what he knows about them goes along pretty much with what the bible says um 
And again, remember, he's looking at it from a point of view. He is not a fan of the Christians. He's a Roman politician. And so uh, he's, you know, he's, he's an executor. He's one of the Roman governors out there that's executing Christians right and left. So it's a pretty important document for us to have on our hands that, that gives us, once more, some evidence that Jesus lived and that some of the things it says in the Bible, uh, he, he pretty much confirms. Now, there are also some Jewish sources about Jesus. Now, remember, Jesus was not a real fan of the Jewish hierarchy, and most certainly, they were not a fan of Jesus. They saw him as a blasphemer. They saw him as a, as a false prophet. And so some of the Jewish sources were not necessarily very favorable toward Jesus. Uh, we have something called the Talmud. The Talmud is uh, a document that puts down the oral tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation by the Jews. If you read the Old Testament, you know that the Jewish people were very uh, serious about passing down their oral, oral traditions. And in this case, um, the Talmud was basically written by about 200 AD. And it combined something called the Mishnah, which was the oral traditions. And then it combined it with written commentaries called the Gemaras. And the combination of these two became the Talmud. And there's a very significant passage in the Talmud. Uh, the passage is, is labeled Sanhedrin 43a. And it dates from the late first century to early second century. So again, within a very short time frame of Jesus' death. And the passage says, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, Jesus, was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, um, he is going forth to be stolen because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forth in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. So this passage in the Talmud pretty much confirms that Jesus was crucified. Now you might say, I thought it said he was hanged. That was, that was how they labeled that. Um, in Galatians 3.13, crucifixion is spoken of as being hung on a pole. And, and very, very common uh, use of the term was hanging, meant crucifixion. And while not specifically recorded in the New Testament, a public announcement of 40 days before stoning is very consistent with the Jewish practice as well as recorded in John 8.58 and 59 and 10.31.33. So this would have not been uncommon for the Sanhedrin, for the hierarchy of the Jewish priesthood to be putting out a, a you know, basically a, uh, a, an announcement that they were going to stone him uh, to death. As it turned out, of course, they couldn't uh, because uh, they would not, the Jewish, the Roman authorities would not let him stone him, and that's why they had to bring him for Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate, of course, ended up uh, confirming his death, and uh, that's why he was crucified or hung on a pole. So this is the, the Talmud. Um, being non-Jewish, I've never read the Talmud. I have no idea what's in it, I'll be honest with you. I just know that it's the uh, oral traditions written down that kind of uh, form uh, information for the priesthood of the Jewish religion. Now, there's another source of information that, about Jesus that is non that doesn't come from the Bible. It's called Gnosticism. Now, I'm not going to go into Gnosticism a lot today because we're going to talk about it in quite a bit of detail later because it plays a very important part in the growth of the Christian church in the late second, early third century. Uh, just suffice it to say that Gnosticism was a challenge to the early Christian church. Uh, it was a heretical movement, and uh, it was classified as such, and the Gnostics became uh, some of the very uh, important uh, people that the, that the early Christian church labeled as heretics. But it's important to know that there is a lot of Gnostic material out there 
we found a whole library in Alexandria, Egypt, outside of Egypt, uh, outside of Alexandria, called the Nag Hammadi Library. And uh, it has tons of documents and scrolls from sources that are non-canonical. They, they do not measure up to uh, what is necessary for a book to be in the Bible. These are called Gnostic sources. What's important is that they do give us some information and they talk quite a bit about Jesus. And so you can look at it from that point of view that historically it might give us some insight. Uh, theologically, uh, you know, the Christian faith does not accept them as such, but historically they may have some information that's important to us. For instance, Here's a book called The Gospel of Truth, written by a man by the name of Valentinius. Valentinius was a, uh, a religious leader, a Christian leader in the early Christian church, and was basically excommunicated because he became a Gnostic. Uh, and he addressed the historicity of Jesus in several short passages. The word came into the midst. It became a body. It stated, for when they had seen him and heard him, he granted them to taste him and to smell him and to touch the beloved son. When he had appeared, instructing them about the father, for he came by means of fleshy appearance. According to the writer, Jesus also died and was raised from the dead. Jesus was patient in accepting sufferings, since he knows that his death is life for many. He was nailed to a tree. He draws himself down to death through life. Having stripped himself down of perishable rags, he put on imperishable ability. So this is from a book that is not a, not a book of the Bible. And it's a book that was written from sources that became known as heretical uh, information. But again, some of this information gives us an insight into the history of Jesus. And uh, these things pretty well go along with what the Bible says right here. I don't think any of us can argue about that. Another Gnostic book was the Apocryphon of John. And this was attributed by a man of Saturninus who lived in the early second century. And he was quoted quite liberally by Irenaeus. You're going to hear about Irenaeus a little bit later. Uh, not today, but later. He was one of the great fathers of the early church. And he wrote a huge treatise called Against Heresies, where he tackled heresies and, uh, you know, wrote about what made them a heresy. And one of those uh, was this Apocrypha and John, but he quotes something from it. It says, it happened one day when John, the brother of James, who was the sons of Zebedee, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us, John and James, the sons of thunder, went up and came to the temple that a Pharisee named Arimanius approached him and said to him, where is your master whom you followed? And John said to him, he has gone to the place from which he came. He was talking about the ascension. He was talking about the fact that, that Jesus had gone through the ascension, had appeared to the apostles, and now had ascended up to be with the Father. And then there's something called the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas is one of those books that a lot of early Christians thought well of. Um, there was some debate about whether or not it should have been let in to the canon, along with a few other books like the Shepherd of Hermes and the Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, these things were, were thought of pretty well, but because they had some, some theology in it that didn't mesh with the theology, the orthodox theology of the church, they were not allowed to be into the Bible. And we're going to talk at quite length about uh, how the Bible was, was put together a little bit later. The Gospel of Thomas was attributed to Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, and it purports to be the word spoken to the people by Jesus after the resurrection and dated from the late second century. So the writer, whoever it was, whether it be Thomas or somebody else, um, says that these were the words that Jesus spoke to the apostles. He said that in the book, Jesus described himself as the son of man and the Salome. Salome uh, was a very important person. Uh, Jesus states, I am he himself who existed undivided. I was given some of the things of my father. See, now right there is where you get in trouble with the Christians. 
because Christians believe that the Father and the Son are the same substance, and they are the same thing. And he's basically saying, no, I'm not quite like my father. I was given some of the things of my father. That's a very important thing about Gnosticism. In another instance, he speaks in more Gnostic terms. Jesus said, it is I who am the light, which is above them all. It is I who am the all. From me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. Uh, this is very much in the realm of the theology of Gnosticism. Um, this, is, this is what a lot of Gnosticistic literature sounds like. Um, so again, uh, theologically, it's not correct, but it most certainly gives us some ideas about the history of Jesus. So the Gospel of Thomas, Gnostic Wisdom of Jesus. Uh, you, you can read most of these books. They're out here. You can uh, get on Amazon and order most of them if you're interested in them. And then there's one called the Treatise, Treatise on Resurrection, written by an unnamed author. We have no idea who wrote it. But again, it tells us some ideas about, it kind of corresponds to what happened in the Bible. Again, it's very much Gnostic. Uh, the Savior swallowed up death. He transformed himself into an, an imperishable aeon, which is an indefinite period of time, and raised himself up, having swallowed the visible by the invisible and gave us the way of our immortality. Do not think the resurrection is an illusion. It is no illusion, but is the truth. It is more fitting to say that the world is an illusion rather than the resurrection, which has come into being through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, again, there's some theological problems here because he's alluding to the fact that everything we see is not necessarily real. And that gets into another heresy called docetism, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but again, it kind of confirms the story of the resurrection as we know it. And then this is a very important one. Uh, there was a very important uh, church father called Justin Martyr. He wrote in the late second century, and he's very well noted for his what were called apologies, uh, where he was basically uh, setting out the case for Christianity, why it was important and why it was real. And he went to the point of actually uh, sending two apologies to the emperor uh, and ended up getting himself executed as a result of it. But uh, he, uh, you know, one of these is something called the Acts of Pontius Pilate. He quotes from this book. We no longer have the book. It was destroyed when the uh, Library of Alexandria burned down. But he quotes from it, and it sounds, he's making it sound as if it was an official document sent to the Roman emperor by Pontius Pilate. Uh, if we had that, that would be an extremely important document to have. But he quotes part of it, so he must have had access to it before it was destroyed. And uh, he further relates the crucifixion on Jesus could be validated by his report. And the expression, they pierced my hands and my feet, was used in reference to the nails on the cross of which were fixed in his hands and feet. And after he was crucified, they cast lots upon his vesture, and they that crucified him parted it among themselves. Wow. That goes right along with what the Bible says. So if this is an actual document by Pontius Pilate, he is confirming the exact events that occurred according to the Bible. Uh, like I said, if we if this ever does appear, and who knows, it could appear. Uh, you know, we have found uh, documents in old monasteries that have been lost for, for centuries, and they've suddenly uh, been found. And sitting in a dusty shelf somewhere behind a bunch of other old documents. So it very well could appear someday. So let's switch gears. Let's look at some of the archaeological evidence that support the life of Jesus. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that there are no direct archaeological artifacts that Jesus left. I mean, Jesus was a nomad. Jesus was a wandering minister. Uh, he really didn't even have a home once his ministry started. 
he, he just lived from place to place and wandered throughout uh, Judea. And so it's not surprising that we have no artifacts that he left behind. What we do have are some places he visited, some artifacts that support events in his life. So let's look at some of this. There are in existence numerous sites identified within a few hundred years of Jesus' life, which are traditionally accepted as authentic. Remember, we talked about this word tradition last week. Many of these sites were identified by Helena, the mother of Constantine. Constantine, remember, was the first Roman emperor who was a Christian. And his mother, Helena, was apparently uh, played a large part in his uh, conversion because she is reportedly was a very strong and devout Christian even before Constantine became one. Once Constantine became a Christian, I'm sure the mother said, I would like to go down and find some of the places that where Jesus worked and lived and some of the places that we could identify. And so he sent his mother down to the Holy Lands. And she reportedly, working through some of the Jewish people and some of the Christians that were on site there, were able to identify some of the locales that play an important part in the life of Jesus. Uh, and remember, this would have occurred about 250 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And while there, obviously there was nobody at these places that remembered Jesus and all, the Jewish people and the early Christian people were very good about handing down oral tradition. So, you know, there is a, you know, some real probability that she found some of these places. Uh, she reportedly identified the sites of Jesus's birth and his ascension and built churches on both of them. That the church of the nativity in Bethlehem and the church of Eleona on the Mount of Olives. She also had a Roman temple tore down on the site where Jesus was reportedly crucified and buried and ordered the construction of a church which was not built during her lifetime, but it was built shortly after she died. It was called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, that church uh, was built in 335 AD, was destroyed about 1009, and then rebuilt again in 1048. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which still stands today, is not the original one that she had built. Uh, the one where you see today was built in the Middle Ages, but it's built on the same site. So this is the church in the nativity. If you go to Bethlehem, this is the church that is built on the site that Hel Helena, Helena identified as the birthplace of Jesus. It was a cave, and you, I understand you can look down in through this, and you can actually see the entrance to the cave where Jesus was born. Uh, this is the church that was built on the Mount of Olives. Again, a very important uh, place in the ministry of Jesus. And she identified the Mount of Olives and had this church built over the Mount of Olives. And then, of course, this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre which is built over the traditional crucifixion place, as well as where his tomb supposedly is. Again, there's some dispute. Some people say it's in the garden tomb, and some people say it's the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, and both have some provenance. But this is the church of the Holy Sepulchre, which she had built. Of course, again, it was torn down. It was destroyed during the uh, Crusades and rebuilt some years later, a few years later, and so this is the one that was built during the Middle Ages. But these are, we have these places due to Helena. Uh, if she had not gone down there, we may not have, you know, time may have lapsed to the point where we could not identify these places. And again, there is dispute about whether or not these places are actually the places that these things happen. Uh, historically, it's very interesting to look at them and to know uh, where these places were that were identified. Theologically, it really doesn't matter. You know, uh, we're not to worship idols and relics. And, uh, you know, as Christians, you know, we, we basically worship Jesus and we worship God. And uh, we don't worship the things of earth. 
And these are the things of earth. Now, there are several relics that are in position, possession of the Catholic Church, which it purports to be associated with Jesus. Uh, you can accept it. You cannot accept it. It's totally up to you. But I thought it would be interesting to show you some of these relics because uh, the church early on identified some relics uh, that supposedly are associated with Jesus. For instance, there are remnants of the true cross, according to the church. When Helena had the Roman temple torn down over the reported site of Jesus, crucifixion and burial, they, have, they reportedly found three wooden crosses, one of which had a plaque bearing the name of Jesus. Uh, and, you know, we know there was a plaque on his cross identifying him as, as the king of the Jews. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what was supposedly on it. Many churches now possess fragmentary remains that are by tradition alleged to be those of the true cross. Again, you can, this is totally up to you if you want to accept that or not. Historically, it is interesting. The crown of thorns. Since about 400 AD, a relic believed by many in the church to be the crown of thorns had been venerated by the Catholic Church. During the first crusade, it was given to King Louis XIV, pardon me, the Ninth of France for safekeeping. And only recently, it was transferred uh, to the Louvre. It had been kept in Notre Dame Cathedral in downtown Paris, but when Notre Dame caught on fire a couple of years ago, um, they had to save a bunch of really valuable things, and one of them was the crown of thorns that the church purports to be the actual uh, crown that Jesus had, and they transported it to the Louvre. I'm going to show you a picture of these in a minute. And then Helena also reportedly found part of the scourging column of Jesus. Remember, they had Jesus, Pontius Pilate had Jesus scourged. He had him whipped, and they would have chained him or tied him to a a basically a you know a piece of marble and so they could basically whip him and uh, she identified part of it and this has been kept ever since the middle ages 1223 uh at St. Pas St. Nah, I can't say it it's a basilica in Rome it's not uh not one of the big ones it's a smaller one but this is where the scourging pole was kept and then there is one that everybody has heard of, the Shroud of Turin. We're going to talk about the Shroud of Turin in a minute because it is the most interesting of all the relics that the church purports to be associated with the life of Jesus. Uh, so here is one of the relics. This is the true cross. This is a fragment of the cross of Jesus who was crucified according to the church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the Catholic church, because remember, they were the only church in the beginning. Uh, it wasn't until the Middle Ages that when the Protestant Reformation came about that you had any, uh, you know, uh, people that challenge the hierarchy of the church. So this is the, uh, this is part of the relic. There are several of these. This is just one of them. And then this is the crown of thorns that supposedly was placed upon Jesus's head. This is uh, also venerated by the church as authentic. And it is now kept in the Louvre because like I said, Notre Dame uh, burned and they got it out of there before it burned down. This is the scourging column where Jesus reportedly was tied to or chained to when he was whipped by the uh, Roman soldiers. And then of course, there is the Shroud of Turin. I think most of us have heard of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, it's a shroud that is kept in the uh, church in Turin, Italy, and it's a category of a relic all by itself because it is so unique. Uh, it's been in existence, we know for sure, since the 14th century. So this is not anything new. We can, we know historically, we can, we can pinpoint it to the 14th century. The Catholic Church claims that they've had it in their possession. Uh, since the first century. And, uh, you know, different people gathered up and kept it, and they claim it to be the actual burial garment of Jesus. So what is the Shroud of Turin? Well, it's a linen cloth measuring about 14 feet by three feet long and about three feet by seven inches wide. 
uh, pardon me, 14 by three inches wide, long and three by seven inches wide, contains a double head to toe image of a crucified man reposed in death that reveals both the obverse and the reverse of the body. Uh, many believe the cloth left Palestine circa 30 AD. There are, the church kind of has a chain of, of uh, evidence here that they can kind of claim and that it was taken to Edessa in central Turkey and then kept in Constantinople for a long time, taken to France for a while and then Switzerland, and then finally ended up in Turin, Italy. And so this is the Shroud of Turin. This is the image. You can see here the image of the face. Uh, and then over here, you can see the image of the body uh, in the reverse and the obverse. Now, the big question is, is it real? Is it the Shroud of Turin? And I mean, is it the actual burial cloth of Jesus? Frankly, there's no way to prove that. Uh, the church says it is. Skeptics basically have, have said, no, this isn't it. There are some really intriguing questions behind the Shroud of Turin. For instance, they have done a lot of scientific study on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, scientists have studied this thing backwards and forwards. They have identified pollen dating from the first century consistent with an origin in Palestine. So scientists have said there is pollen located on this, on this piece of cloth that is consistent with what you would find in Palestine around the first century. There's also an analysis of the, of the type of cloth itself, and it's shown to be compatible with the first century cloth. Uh, you know, so maybe somebody had a piece of first century cloth and made this thing, or maybe it's the actual burial cloth. Again, there's no way to know for sure. Photographic and computer enhancement of the garment possibly, that's a key word, possibly shows an image of a coin placed over the eyes. This would have been very common to place coins over the eyes of the deceased. Some say it is a coin with Pontius Pilate's image and name that was meant in sometime between 29 and 32 AD. There's a lot of people that doubt this is really it. It's not, we have not got to the point where we can totally identify that, but some people say they can see it. Carbon 14 dating, this is a critical piece of information. Uh, in 1988, they took a piece of the garment and they, dated it with carbon-14 dating, and it dated to the late Middle Ages, which is about when we know the Shroud of Turin first came into, uh, that we can trace it back there, the provenance. Here's the problem. People that, that say the Shroud of Turin is real said the problem is they did carbon-14 dating on pieces of the Shroud that were patched in the Middle Ages. Again, you know, that's something that you can take or not take. The type of burial shown is consistent with first century practices outlined in the Code of Jewish Law, as well as Qumran burial practices. So we know that how this body that's shown on this cloth was buried is consistent with the way they buried first century Jews. Uh, the pathologist have studied this garment and they say that the man was definitely crucified and that he was definitely dead at the time of burial. They've also determined the man's injuries are consistent with the gospel reports. So when they studied this image that's on this cloth, they said, this is what they found. They found a series of punctures through the scalp from sharp objects would have been consistent with placing the crown of thorns on his head. They said that they found a seriously bruised face. Again, this is remember, he was beaten to within almost to death before he was ever crucified. They identified over 100 whip marks on his back, again, consistent with a scourging. They found abrasions on both shoulders from what would appear to be from a rough, heavy object. In other words, when he carried the cross. They found contusions on both knees, and we know that Jesus fell several times as he was going to Golgotha carrying the cross. They found puncture wounds on the feet and the wrist, which were consistent with Roman crucifixion. 
and they found post-mortem chest wounds, wounds on the on the body that apparently uh, were put there after he was dead. And there was no sign of bodily decomposition. And the blood stains on the cloth were definitely blood. Now, this is what the people that support the Shroud of Turin say. There are people that would that would deny all this. But here's the key, okay? And this is what's important to me. The biggest question surrounding the shroud is how was the image made? And the short answer is nobody can explain it. Science had dealt, had tried to figure this out, tried to figure out how in the world was this image placed upon this cloth? And they cannot figure it out. And scientists will admit this goes against everything that they can uh, they can prove scientifically. It should not have happened. And they say most definitely in the Middle Ages it should not have happened. Uh, it was they know the image is not paint. They know it's not dye. They know it's not powder or any other foreign substance. They have identified it as being what's called an oxidated, dehydrated, and then conjugated fibers that resembles a scorch mark. Very interesting. Additional characteristics of the image, such as the 3D superficial and non-directional nature of the image, cannot be explained scientifically. It just, they just can't do it. They don't know how it was made. It is a scientific mystery. And that's the thing that intrigues me the most about the Shroud of Turin. I will be the first to admit I've always been somewhat of a skeptic about the realistic value of the Shroud of Turin, but it intrigues me. I would like for science to be able to tell me how this thing was made, and they can't do it. So the bottom line is, while the Shroud appears to be consistent with the crucifixion and the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, there's no way to prove historically it is his burial shroud. However, the consistency of the shroud with biblical descriptions, plus the inability of science to determine the nature of the image, the lack of bodily composition, the apparent lack of unwrapping and probable presence of an image seemingly caused by scorch from a dead body all make it possible as being the burial shroud of Jesus does not mean that that's what it is. But here's what's important to keep in mind, folks. Again, this is, this is interesting historically. Uh, and again, I'm kind of getting into the realm of theology here, so I've, I'm doing what I said I shouldn't do. But it, it really doesn't matter to us as Christians whether it's real or it's not real, because we're not worshiping this shroud. This thing is not anything that we are worship. It's, it's an interesting thing, and we look at it, and it's interesting, and it's important if it is but it doesn't make any difference. We worship Jesus. So archeological evidence of Jesus of some of the events, and I have to hurry through some of these. There is something called the Galilee boat. It's a wooden fishing boat found in the Sea of Galilee, Galilee in 1986, which dates from the time of Jesus and affirms the type of boat likely used by Peter and the other apostles. It's, it's not Peter's boat. Well, I guess it could be. But most people don't claim that. They're just saying it's the kind of boat that Peter most likely would have used. That's important because when we think about Jesus in the boat and the fishermen in the boat, it's kind of interesting to see what that boat looked like. There's the synagogue of Magdala. Uh, the remains of the synagogue in the likely home of Mary Magdalene was uncovered recently and affirms the historical description of synagogues found in the Bible. Remember, synagogue. And every town had one. And it's where the Jewish people met and said their prayers and read their, their uh, testament, as, they, as we call it. The Pool of Siloam. In 2004, 2004, the Pool of Siloam, where Jesus reportedly healed the blind man, was found and dated to the first century. So we finally found this thing. And the one where he put the mud on the eyes and, uh, of the guy and, and healed his sight. Then there's Jacob's well, the well where Jesus reportedly met a Samaritan woman and revealed that he was the Messiah. Has, this has been around for a long time. 
and it's been called Jacob's Well, and it is almost everyone that is associated with, with studying the Bible says this is probably Jacob's Well. I mean, it's one of those, it's one of the few places that there's quite a bit of unanimity on whether or not it's real or it's not real. The temple warning inscription, we know from the Bible and from Josephus and other sources that there would have been a warning at the entrance to the temple grounds, warning not to bring Gentiles into this area. And remember, that's what Paul got in so much trouble about. That's what led to his taking to his trial between Festus and Felix, and eventually his uh, taking to Rome was because he was accused of bringing uh, Gentiles into the temple area. And so it's important that we have found this warning inscription. We have found that we've actually found one. And then there's the ossuary box of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a high priest, and we have found his bone box. That's what they call them. That's what an ossuary is. They would allow a body to disintegrate, and then they close the bones of that person and put them in a box with their name. Um, and that's how they kept them. And then there's what's called the pilot stone. In 1961, they unearthed a limestone block that was unearthed at Caesarea Maritima, which is dedication to Tiberius from Pontius Pilate, the man who basically presided over the trial of Jesus. And then we finally found in 1968, the heel bone of a crucifixion. But it was found in an ossuary box of a man by the name of Johannan. And this was a Jewish that had been crucified. And his heel bone still has the nail embedded in it. You might say, well, gosh, that's nothing unusual. Yeah, it is. Because most of these, uh, don't, they, they don't exist. And this, again, gives us some evidence of the fact that crucifixions really did occur. So here's the Galilee fishing boat. This is a boat that was unearthed in the mud on the Sea of Galilee. It would have been the kind of boat that Jesus and Peter and Andrew and John and James and uh, some of the other apostles uh, went fishing in. Um, looks pretty flimsy to me. <laughs> of course, it's 2,000 years old. This is the synagogue of Magdala, where Mag Mary Magdalene uh, was born and raised. This would have been the synagogue uh, that she would have attended later. Because remember, Mary Magdalene had a kind of checkered past, to say the least. This is the Pool of Siloam, uh, where Jesus healed the blind man, according to the Bible. And again, it's very consistent with the description of that pool in the Bible. This was found in 2004, unearthed. This is Jacob's well. This is uh, an extremely important uh, place in the Old and the New Testament, both. And so, uh, again, this is the, uh, one of those places that's uniformly uh, pretty much identified as the site where Jacob's well was. This is the ossuary box of Caiaphas. This is where the bones of the high priest Caiaphas were placed once his body had disintegrated. And again, it just gives us evidence that Caiaphas act. And this is the Pontius Pilate stone, uh, stone that was erected in Caesarea Maritima uh, to Tiberius from Pontius Pilate, who was the governor at that time of Jerusalem, Judea. And this is the heel bone of the crucified man. And you can see there, you can see that's embedded in his heel. Uh, again, a very important thing because we don't have evidence of actual crucifixions. And this is one of the few things that we have of it. So next week, we are going to begin a study of the apostles. What do we know of apostles historically? Again, I'm staying out of the lane of theology as much as possible. So we're going to look at and see what we can see about them from a historical point of view. We'll kind of try to put a, because uh, to be honest about, they were kind of a motley crew, uh, which is kind of that Jesus would pick this bunch of people to follow him. And they were for most a uh, pretty rough bunch. 
but yet they became the cornerstone of the Christian faith. So we will see you next week. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you learned something today. Uh, and I can guarantee you that the Garden of Gethsemane behind me is a much more pleasant looking place than what's facing me <laughs> through my window outside. It's rainy and gloomy here. So it's turned sunny here now, but it's been all rainy today. <laughs> <laughs>